Why should we fear the American dream? We should fear the American dream if our ideals around success aren't around money. All of this work that I'm doing isn't for the things anymore, it's for the family. We don't really measure ourselves with, with people who are out of our league. Status anxiety comes from you comparing yourself to the people around you, your inner circle. Welcome to the show. Thank you for taking part in this immersive listening experience. A meaningful existence is a moving target that no matter how close, will always be out of reach. We hope this message finds you with an outstretched hand. As we attempt to uncover complex truths, remember, life's toughest questions can be answered if we all just focus on one thing. Being good people. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Good People, episode 24. Today, I was joined by Gage Greer. He has an online channel called Turtleneck Philosophy, where he teaches his audience about existentialism. In today's episode, we talked about what it means to be an existentialist, how one could go about starting to think about philosophy and their existence, and all the benefits of jujitsu. If you are watching on YouTube, please like, comment, and subscribe, and turn on notifications so you don't miss our weekly episodes. Enjoy the show. All right, Gage Greer, Turtleneck Philosophy, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Joel. I got a quick question. Is Turtleneck Philosophy like your alter ego code name, or is it just more like an idea, kind of like good people as an idea? Yeah, it's more of like an idea, like good people. I'd say it's uh, it, it kind of lends you, it's paying homage to the old iconic Turtleneck back in the day when existentialism was more of a fad back in the 1950s. So you, you saw it on Audrey Hepburn and a lot of other existentialists, they rocked the turtleneck. So it's it's to kind of jive with that mood. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's more of an idea and then an appeal to history. Yeah. And then it okay. can be a... Go ahead. I was going to say, and it has informed our decision to look dapper today. And if anybody's yeah. watching on YouTube... You can see that we look spectacular in our own turtlenecks. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> very hot under the collar. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. All right, man. So let's start with telling the audience a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, um, name is Gage Rear. I, uh, you, to my history, uh, my background is in psychology and philosophy. So. Uh, I studied philosophy and, and psychology in the university, and that's how I kind of got into what I do on on YouTube. Grew into uh, that grew into existentialism through my studies in applied philosophy and getting into pragmatism. And I always had just had an interest in philosophy and uh, deeper thinking, and and uh, how that related to poetry and how, what was the connection there. So yeah, it naturally evolved into creatively expressing myself through YouTube and I got more technical. So I also work in media and have my own little media company here in Austin, Texas. So that involves like podcasting, like what we're doing now, setting up production sets and uh, doing media and editing and stuff like that. And so that's how I also do all of all the things that you see on my YouTube channel. I do myself. Uh, from editing to After Effects and animation and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's uh, it's it's kind of like who I am and what I've been doing. Why have you do you have this interest in philosophy? Where does that come from? Man, I guess it's just who I am. Like that's at a core. I, I am deeply curious about ideas. And it hasn't always been like that, but definitely around college, I got more interested into complex ideas. And I think it's because the curiosity element that I've, that I, that I touched on to my personality, it's hard to understand and grip, uh, grasp. And naturally that intrigues me. So I want to spend more time trying to figure it out. And that's just the nature of philosophy. And then you get bogged down in ideas and you talk about it more and you talk about it more and you end up building more of an interest. The more that you do that, like with anything. Uh, the more that you work out, even though you hate working out, you end up liking it because it, it's the majority of what you do in your day. And it's like with any job, if, if you have a nine to five, you eventually, if you're selling insurance, you're eventually going to like what you do in that it's like 
what you know. And then you end up talking about it with your friends, even though you might hate it at, at the core level. It's uh, it's end of, it's what occupies the most of your space in your in your in your memory bank, so to speak. Yeah, so. the idea of curiosity is a cool point that I think that I also have as well. And I've always said, growing up, I wish that I could do a part time job or lots of different part time jobs because I have so many different interests. But underneath all of that, for me, is this curiosity, which is one of the reasons why I like this form of content so much, both creating it and consuming it is because in these long form hour to three hour conversations that a lot of podcasters are putting out, you get to sort of uncover that. And it's not an efficient use of time or a productive use of time necessarily. But, you know, getting to know a person through an interview, or getting to know an idea at a deeper level, through all of the boring stuff is something that I'm naturally drawn to. So it's, it's very interesting that you sort of have that as well. Yeah, it, it's intriguing. And it's also, it informs how to live. So I think that's also helpful because at several points in my life, I was feeling at a loss for what I should do. And seeking out advice was obviously a thing. It was just like, what should I do in life? What So like, what are your interests? And I felt like, going into philosophy and reading philosophy definitely guided that, uh, that direction of how to figure that out for myself in terms of measuring my values, my, what I'm interested in and how I want to help the world or how much I want to, ex you know, extend help to the world. So, and then exploring the avenues, what's available, uh, in the real world that can be an outlet for all those interests, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, more so philosophy is helping out to explore the inner self and, trying to build a trajectory towards uh, happiness in the long run instead of in the short run. So I think uh, philosophy was intriguing that way. That's what brought me to philosophy is just this sense of how do I go about life? I think that's one of the things that draws me to it. And we'll get more into this in a second, but I've mainly consumed and I've shared this with you before the podcast, uh, Eastern Asian philosophy, a lot of stoicism, and one of the reasons why I'm drawn to this and one of the reasons why I do this podcast, Good People, is when I started working in the fitness space, which is my quote unquote day job, it was from this point of view of helping people. And I think part of living a good life is being in shape and being capable and being physically fit and trying to live a long time. But there was this aspect of living that I wasn't interfacing with. I was interfacing with personally, but I wasn't helping other people with. And it was thinking and existing pretty much, you know? And so it's been cool to explore that side of things, which sort of gets us into the first question that I want to ask you is what does it mean to be an existentialist? Yeah, no, it's a good question to what it means to be an existentialist is having an attitude towards philosophizing and philosophizing in the sense of, of not having an end goal in mind. Um, like it's, it's not an equation. It's not like a math equation that you're trying to come out with a, a clear cut, absolute answer in the end of it, in the end of the investigation, it's under understanding that philosophizing is this endless open-ended process that you're going to continue doing. And it very much, it harmonizes what, with what we are in nature. We are, we're a process. We're not any kind of fixed identity to be, or we're not any kind of absolute at any kind of fixed time. So given the nature of who we are, that needs to be the, the nature of what we do in, in our thought process and our philosophizing. So again, uh, to be an existentialist is to, to always constantly have, carry this attitude of doubt, this attitude of doubt, and that I could be wrong and it could be otherwise. So entertaining the counterfactual that it could be otherwise and I could be wrong. And so let's explore where I could be wrong so that I can ultimately live a, a better life and uh, not be so pigheaded and, and bigoted in, in one directional. So it's, and there's many existentialisms. So existentialism as a philosophy, it's, it's kind of misleading because there are as many existentialisms as there are people. So you have your own existentialist existentialism I has my own because it's centered in these in the subjective it's centered in the person's experience 
So what your experience is different from my experience. So by nature of that, you're going to have a different existentialist approach because it's very catered to it. It's very individualistic to how you see the world, how you perceive things. I get frustrated with that, I guess, framework in myself, because what you're saying is ringing a lot of bells for me in terms of, I'm, I feel like, especially since I've started this podcast and talking to a lot of people, this is where I live, where I'm constantly unsure. I don't know if I should pursue this or I should pursue that, or if I should follow this feeling or if I should follow that feeling. And sometimes I wake up and I want to train really hard in the gym and I'm all about hustling hard and mindset and motivation. And then other times I wake up and I'm like, all of that's bullshit. You know, don't worry about uh, building this public persona and just focus on building a life for your family. You know, there's this, you're pulled in so many different directions. Mm -hmm. I think especially in this day and age, because we're connected so well with social media that this, your point of there are as many ex existentialisms as there are people is frustrating in the sense that I feel this way and I battle with that. And I feel like there's that many existentialisms within me specifically, but it's also at times I feel like it's an unfinished answer. I had a lady on the show who talked to me about the spiritual, but not religious community. And she said something along the lines of, it's not about the answers. It's about the questions themselves, right? I think this mm -hmm. is something that a lot of philosophers theorize and bring up. And I guess my question with this is, what do we do with that, right? Because if we just sort of have this dialogue about, it's just about the questions and you should always be unsure, how does that help us get someplace? Does that question make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So if it's, uh, I guess, let me try, try to repeat what you're saying. If it's all about just questioning things and coming up, satisfying, coming up with sufficient answers that aren't absolute, uh, I, I, I feel like that is really just kind of, it's corresponding to the nature of reality, because I don't think there are absolutes in terms of what we should do with your life. Like you trying to come up, oh, what should I do? Is it, is it going to be building this gym is it going to be uh, focused being more family centered in my approach. And the answer is just yes and no, man, you can do both. Like that's, and that is the heart of one of the most the existentialist themes is the sense of responsibility and freedom because you really are free to do whatever you want. You are burdened with a sense of responsibility for your own person. And that's uh, really getting at the heart of existentialism. And carrying that burden is is what it means to live authentically. So you embracing that full heartedly uh, and affirming that fact that you are fully responsible uh, for the path that you take and that you can take whatever path is the most authentic thing that you can do, most brave and courageous thing you can do. And I um, see. and yeah, I'm, I'm, I didn't really get at the. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, I think it kind of points me in the right direction where I'm starting to see that it's not necessarily that there are all these things and we never wind up with a solution. It is that there is, needs to be a recognition and acceptance of the fact that there are infinite possibilities and you have to decide which ones are the most worthwhile to you. And at times, for, for me, for example, sometimes there's conflicting interests or there's so many interests that you couldn't possibly do all of them in one human lifetime. And that's where it comes down to prioritizing the th things that are really the most important to you. Yeah. And the thing is, Joel, it's going to change. So your interests wax and wane and you think that doing one thing that, or you're going to achieve happiness or uh, the sense of satisfaction, fulfillment in doing one thing, say it's opening up a gym and, uh, or talk to people doing podcasts for a while, but then you end up doing it for a while and you just you know what, this isn't really bringing me lasting fulfillment. But then because your ecosystem, your environment is, is changing in, in as much, if not more rapidly than you are given the technological advancement, you're seeing other windows of opportunity to where your shifting interests can align with an outlet into the, the outer, the outer world and what, what's being presented to you 
uh, with an external opportunity. And so it's just right again, that's the process of it. It's just, and that's the constant, what it means to be an existentialist is you're constantly self-reflecting and checking in on where you're at and where your interests lie and your values are at, because even your values can shift ever so subtly. And then aligning that with an action plan and what you want to do in the world as, as you're also analyzing what's going on in the world and saying, is that going to measure out? Is that going to map into eventually going to meet the values that are ever so shifting in me? You put out a video re- relatively recently of what it means to be an existentialist. You broke down different aspects of it. And again, to honor sort of what we were talking about, obviously this is many, many things, but some specific things that you named in the video were tangible experience, radical freedom, and situations, among other things. Mm -hmm. But talk to me a little bit about that. Let's start with tangible experience and how this relates to being an existentialist. Sure. So existentialism was really different on at the onset of existentialism when it, when it came on the scene through the likes of Jean-Paul Sartre, Albert Camus, Simone de Beauvoir, they were really emphasizing tangible, concrete experiences and philosophizing about that because beforehand, prior to that project of existentialism, philosophy was just analytical philosophy. And it meant looking at the, the metaphysics. And, and so the, what metaphysics is really the, the beyond of what we see and can detect with our five senses. And it, that gets into like what Plato and Aristotle and all, even the, the pre-Socratics were getting into. It's understanding of there are things beyond what we can see and perceive and how those are the most real and true things. And we need to philosophize about those abstractions and, and concrete experience on a human level was secondary. It wasn't really a philosophical project at all. It, it was just a, a side effect of, of what philosophy really is. And so existentialism made that the emphasis instead of the abstract, it became the concrete human experience that is the point of interest for philosophy. And so that's what, that's what I meant by that's what means. Uh, that's why I said that in the video. And I, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on applying that to anybody listening's life, because what that kind of makes me think of is something that I deal with a lot in the strength and conditioning world, which is sometimes research suggests one thing, but a person's practical experience suggests another. And so maybe they're not doing the most quote unquote optimal form of exercise, but objectively it's been the thing that has gotten them the most results. And I mean, I, I'll have this conversation with people of like, what can I do to optimize my training? And I'm like, if you look at what you're doing right now, you are making more progress than you've ever made before in the time that we've been training together. So why would we try to do anything different, no matter what literature or anything else says, right? And so I think that's where my brain goes. And I'm curious if you have any extra thoughts on that. Yeah, no, it's a very existentialist approach. Even in the dieting world, I, I would say even more so because it's less, every human system is different. You know, it, everyone responds to food completely different than the person uh, than the person next to them. So it's really important to kind of listen to your body and, and seeing when you feel energy, you know, is it, is it through intermittent fasting? Is it through eating in the morning, like right in the morning and then uh, having chunks of meals throughout the day, like snacks throughout the day, or is it three main meals or even the content of what you eat? That kind of, is it fruit? You know, are you going to be juicing just to get the carbs? And I know you, you know, way more about this than I do. But the point is that people have widely different opinions on what works based off of their own anecdotal anecdotal evidence, their own subjective experience. Because that, that's what hints them in that direction for, towards why they'll have that philosophy around dieting and food. Uh, same with what, uh, what goes on in the gym, even le- less so, but for some people, they have um, different unorthodox way of of doing a lift, uh, you, you'll see this in Olympic lifters. They'll have some kind of weird way to manipulate the bar to to work it in their favor to get to a certain position, and you just say, "Well, that was kind of whack in the way that they did that," um, but it works for their body because each body is very different. Yeah, and uh, what yeah. that makes me think of too is 
I'm a I'm a weightlifting coach. That's what I specialize in. This is what I know the most about, specific to the Olympic lifts. And so what that makes me immediately go to is anytime you're watching the Olympics, the highest level of weightlifting you'll ever see on the world stage, when you see some of those nuanced things where you go, Oh, hmm, that was weird. Maybe an individual was more on their toes or, um, they had a weird dip and drive to their jerk or their receiving position in their, in their jerk was different than most people, or they squat jerked it or whatever. A lot of people and a lot of novice lifters go, well, I should try to do that because they're the best in the world. And what people don't realize is the decades of work it took to establish these things. And so as a coach, I often have this conversation with clients like, no, we're going to learn to do this the textbook way. And as you become an expert, which general population people likely will never become an expert at Olympic style weightlifting. Uh, as you become an expert, you can sort of just develop those nuanced things on your own and they just kind of happen. And so that just makes me think of, it's not just about your tangible experience too. It's about creating this resume of lots and lots and lots of work to figure out what actually is the thing that moves the needle for you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think the common saying is like, learn the rules uh, so that you can learn to break the rules, something like that. Yeah. Uh, but My jiu-jitsu yeah, instructor says that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And jujitsu is very much the same because yeah. jujitsu is different, way different depending on your body type. Mm -hmm. So you'll, I have some questions later yeah. on about jujitsu because I know you're a jujitsu guy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we won't we'll get into it. Yeah. We won't get too far down that hole right now. We'll come back to it. Okay. Um, I want to touch on these for a second too. Radical freedom. We talked, we talked about this at the beginning is another characteristic of an existentialist. What exactly does that mean that separates it from free will as one would normally think of? So, yeah, I, I, <laughs> those are two. So free will in itself is a, uh, it, it's kind of been missing over, but from an existentialist point of view, back in the traditional view of radical freedom and how they were saying it, it's because the, the, the mentality back in the day and, and the mindset was that, okay, God is dead, you know, from the, the Nietzschean claim that God is dead. We, meaning that we don't have to go to these textbooks, these ancient textbooks and look at the, derive the meaning from those textbooks to determine how we're going to live our lives, that we can actually create our own meaning. And because you can, it's kind of what I was touching at before, because we can, uh, we can be our own gods in a sense. We can do whatever we want. We're not um, subjected to a higher power. Uh, we have that freedom to do this or that. You know, we don't. There's not the there's not the ten commandments of our lives that are that are hanging over our heads that we should, uh, you know, not steal, not not do this. Even though it's not productive and and good that you should that you uh, it's not good that you should steal. Uh, from my point of view, but I can't really, from an existentialist point of view, I can't tell you that that's wrong, especially given the, the wide amount of variety of experiences or situations that you can find yourself in, because there's a lot of gray areas of when certain things should be wrong and, and not wrong. And that'll depend on the person and their values, their value set. And anyway, the point is radical freedom is this place that you find yourself in when you don't have rules or regulations from a higher power hanging over your head. And you're just like, wow, I am, I can just do whatever I want. I'm, I'm, I don't have re responsibility or have to confess to someone or why I do what I do. Where do you think that leads us? Because I would, I would actually even argue to say that that idea is pretty scary because we are sort of living through it. Um, I don't know. I've heard people say that we're in a post-Christian society now mm -hmm. um, in, in, in the United States, but what you're getting at here is something that is fearful in the sense that it is awesome that we have the ability to sort of choose our own value systems, but it seems like people aren't even doing that or not giving enough thought to the values that they actually uh, want to uphold and and stick with as individuals. Um, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why everybody feels like we're all fighting against each other all the time now is because yeah. 
maybe not necessarily that people don't have values, but there's just so many different value systems. Yeah. Yeah. And they're very polarizing for sure. Um, it is scary. It is scary that we have to, but that's why I would kind of go back to that first principle that I was talking about of upholding doubt so that you can always be in a position to entertain the other person. I think that is the, the heart of wisdom is I think it was Socrates that said the wisdom is being able to entertain a thought without accepting it. Mm. So I can entertain what you're saying, but I don't necessarily have to accept it. And that's wisdom. Whereas what you see in a lot of modern politics is that there's just this shouting matches uh, and, and it's really trying to get your point across without ever hearing the other person's point of view and not even really wanting to, because you come into the debate, you come into the discourse with just the, the motivation to get your point across, to get what you want out of, you know, in the politics, in the, yeah, the policy setting. And, um, and it's just very, it turns into a very aggressive thing because they, they believe so strongly in a certain, uh, a certain politic. And, um, yeah, it can, it can be scary, but at the same time, I think that's what, that's what it means to be human. And that's the challenge that we have set before us. And I think it's the more honest and, um, I think corresponds with more reality than, than saying that, okay, there are these pre pre-designed set rules and lists that we should adhere to. And those are the absolutes. We do have a, a constitution kind of set on that in that we're, we take these as, um, I mean, the constitution is that these are um, evidently true, right? That we're, that we're sovereign individuals created in the image of God with the um, unalienable rights of uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And uh, we take these as undeniable facts. And that's the, those are kind of assumptions. Those are a, a starting point. And I would even, I would even claim that starting point as well, that that is the first principle that we should all consider each other as equal and as humans, and that we should run off of that axiom. So that, that, that is a starting point. If I, if you don't take that as an axiom or a starting point, and you, you say that all humans aren't the same and shouldn't be, and shouldn't be treated the same, then we just can't have a conversation. Okay. It's just like, mm -hmm. we have to take that on first principle before we can even have a conversation. If we're not starting there, then we're just going to be arguing past each other and, and talking past each other. So it's just not going to work out. But I feel like all humans understand that. And I think the constitution was a, a, a step in the right direction to see that all humans are created equal. You put out a piece of content about the American dream mm. recently. And I'm asking this question and it's going to loop back around to what you and I were just talking about, which is this idea of radical freedom. And maybe you can sort of already see where I'm trying to make this connection. Uh, but why should we fear the American dream? Why should we fear the American dream? So we, we should fear the American dream if our ideals around success aren't around money. And because if it is, then everything that we're going to be doing is measured upon whether we're attaining money, whether we're get, gaining more wealth or not. And it's just an extreme, you know, if, if that's what you want to do and that's, those are the values that you have set, it's more about monetarily gain. And, and that's, uh, what makes you happy and feel fulfilled by all means from an existentialist point of view, that's what you should be doing. And that's great. Um, so I don't know if, if I would agree with the premise, I don't, I don't know if we should fear the American dream. I, I think it's, um, it, it's not very, very conducive to a lot of people and they're from what I see, the majority of people and their ideals around well being don't really revolve around the American dream because the American dream is, is centered around monetary gain. It's, it's centered around just getting wealthier. And I don't think that really fulfills a lot of people at heart. Uh, yes, it gets, I mean, even the, the literature will even tell us that you happiness can only be gained through a certain, a certain uh, status or wealth threshold. It's like around hundred K or so. Like after hundred K, 
you're you're buying happiness just it, it doesn't it doesn't pan out as well as you would think it doesn't double so like 100k to 200k that's that doesn't that only gets you about 10 percent more happiness just as just as an example and so after you again reach a certain threshold money doesn't really buy you happiness because at a certain point at 150k you can pretty much get satisfy all of your your needs from a homeostatic standpoint you can get all you you don't go hungry you don't you know you're you're not you can sleep you can find a uh, you can find a spouse with the same kind of values that you have like you're pretty much set if you're if you have 100k in the bank per year and um so the the American dream, uh, it's, it's also centered around status and that's, it's that, that's a, a big difference because we can go into that more. I, I don't know if I sufficiently answered the question of, of what that is, but, um, it, it's a contrast to how the story was told back in the day around how we should, uh, it was a Christian narrative, right? So the, the story that, uh, there are these three class systems and that everyone should be, be shaking hands with each other because we're all made in the image of God. And this is the way that God has designed society to work, that there should be nobility, that there should be the clergy and there should be peasantry and that the poor should be happy and content where they're at. That's just because they were born as poor. They should live out life as poor and they shouldn't expect anything outside of a poor life in the future. Like if your father was a blacksmith, you should expect to become a blacksmith and that removes any kind of anxiety that you would ever experience. Right. Cause I, I don't have to think about what I'm going to be in the future. Like, like what you're doing now, like you're having that, like, what should I become? I, sh I should do this. I should do that. All of that is removed back in, in the medieval era when you, you are born to the, to the son of blacksmith as a son to the blacksmith. And it's just like, okay, well that's my life. You know, and there's just no anxiety of that. Anxiety is about is, is is just this not knowing, having this deep uncertainty for the future, and that's what causes angst and anxiety. And so, with the onset of this radical freedom, I think I kind of I kind of feel where where you where you were going that. So, with the onset of radical freedom through the story of the American dream, that you can do whatever you want, you can become whatever you want, and the sky is the limit for you. So go and be whatever you want to be. That puts the onus on you to now do whatever you want and achieve this status. Like you, you have a, a an open free ride to to achieve nobility. Should you should should you should you choose to do so? Mm -hmm. And if you don't, that's kind of um, because everyone gets told that they can be whatever they want to be, and the sky's the limit. It's inherently like the, the assumption in it inherently is that that's what you should be doing. Like to aspire for less is a sin from a, from an American point of view who, who who carries the American dream. You're missing the mark. Like sinning means to miss the mark. You're you're not you're not you're not aiming for the bullseye. Why wouldn't you aim for the bull? Why would you attain less when you live in a society where you can gain whatever you want? So there's this pressure that we always feel to always move up the ladder in some in some sense to 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 continually be acquiring more and more status and that's typically through the attainment of wealth so and that whole the rat race that's that's kind of the world we live in to to subscribe to that full, wholeheartedly and put all your your value in that is um that's what it means to uh, live inauthentically from mm. if, if again, if your heart really isn't in that and you don't really want to do that, but that's because society is telling you to do that. That's what it means to live in bad faith. As Jean-Paul Sartre would say to live inauthentically, you're not being the, the truest version of yourself that you could be because you're just doing what society is doing. You're uh, living this American dream life when really that's not really what you want to do. To explore that idea a little bit more, and you sort of made some of the connections that I was looking for there, right? There's this idea that we have radical freedom. And sort of what I was trying to propose with that is a lot of the status anxiety that you were talking about, where we now put so much value on achieving a certain monetary value or a certain amount of things. 
in a way comes from this idea that God is dead or this existentialist idea of radical freedom, where we really do have the ability to choose whatever we not only want to do, but what we want to want to do, right? And so what I'm sort of getting at here is a lot of the anxiety that we're feeling is coming from this idea that we do have this radical freedom. And I want to read a quote to you that sort of ties this in even a little bit more. David Foster Wallace, who is a known existentialist, we've quoted him before on this podcast. I've encouraged a lot of people who have listened to listen to his speech, This is Water. Uh, I would reiterate that point if you've never listened to it. It's a great thing to listen to. But there's a quote from This is Water that I'm going to read to you. You get to consciously decide what has meaning and what doesn't. Because here's something else that's weird but true. In the day-to-day trenches of adult life, there's actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And he goes on to list a number of things that people worship. What we're talking about right now is this worshiping of stuff or a monetary value or a certain lifestyle that's usually given to you by a certain monetary value. Like I think the popular thing right now is to move to the countryside and get a cold plunge in a sauna and live your life in that way. Right. Um, but that's like a, another, that's a status thing. It's, it's popular to have a farm style house and you know that's what everybody wants right now. And so my point with all of this is I'm actually arguing, I think that there could be some danger to the realization that you have radical freedom because what is enticing, at least to me, and I think most people, and that's representative of where we've gotten to as a society, are those status symbols that make you higher than your neighbor or or whatever. But um, I guess I'm just sort of interested to hear your thoughts a bit more on that. Do you think that there are any dangers to that realization is is that a potential drawback of existentialism or or being an existentialist it's it can promote a lot of confusion for sure it, it's yeah not knowing that um being in a place where everything is open it is is on the market and you can do whatever you want is is absolutely anxiety provoking i mean it, it kind of goes back to uh, status anxiety, really, it's, it's this idea that you can do whatever you want, and it's up to you. And you are, you're going to be measured. And, and it's also knowing that because it, it's assuming that you'll pursue the best that you can do. And if you wherever you're at, you can always see people above you. And if it's not spoken to you, you kind of whisper it to yourself, like, my inherent value is really measured to where my status is currently and in inherent value, meaning like my, uh, my capacity for goodness, my capacity for ambition, my, uh, my competence overall is really kind of where I found myself amongst society, how I measure myself against a, 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 along my peers. So uh, that is, that's also kind of, anxiety provoking because it's this story that I shouldn't, I, I should have, um, because I didn't reach the top that I'm somehow less than inherent on in my inherently as, as my character or my person. And, um, yeah, it's just not, it's not a good way to live. I, I think it's just that, that story. And I, I say that in the video, how that, that really can be misleading, leading and damaging psychology for a lot of people who subscribe to that consciously or unconsciously. Um, but yeah, getting, getting to you, to your point more so, sorry, I, I kind of went on a tangent in a different direction, but I think it can be a danger. Um, yeah. Not having some kind of path. And I, I was actually fortunate. I grew up in a Christian home and I really had the comfort of Christianity to outline how I should live. It gave me my morals and it's, it's a really good blueprint in, I actually enjoyed my Christian upbringing, um, despite what people might think. Uh, I think it's it's a really good model to have when you don't 
really want to think it about it for yourself. And thinking is a really hard thing to do. Uh, it, so like philosophy, not a lot of people, it's, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort and, and not a lot of people have that or that interest really to, to investigate their inner self and what they should be doing and have that spiritual, um, yeah, that spiritual engagement. So it's, it can be damaging for it, for those people who don't want to do that because, um, it's, yeah, it's anxiety provoking. It can cause a lot of, of psychological disruption. Uh, you get that cognitive dissonance of cognitive dissonance, meaning like there's a belief outside of what you believe and there's the friction between what's being said and what, what, what's going on in your, what you think internally, uh, should be the case. So there's a lot of that internal friction and yeah, subsequent psychological disruption. And I think it can be damaging. But um, I, I still, regardless of that, I think it's the right way to go move forward um, uh, because, um, I'm sorry, I, I got, <laughs> got distracted there. Um, I think it's the right way to move forward because it's, it's the most authentic way to live as a human. I, when, if, and I, I appreciate, let me just say this. I do appreciate Christianity nowadays because it's, it's being subjected to updates. So if you notice that in, in a lot of, a lot of religions kind of fall in the same category, I think Islam would be the only exception where they don't give way to certain updates where, but Christianity, I mean, back in just in the 1970s, they didn't even allow people to, uh, didn't allow women to speak from the pulpit or go to a seminary, which is like the master's programs for the theology. Um, they used to not so long ago allow, um, um, yeah, uh, homosexuality was a big deal. So, uh, and now it's kind of being more widely accepted through the church. So you see this evolution, the culture is affecting the, the fabric of the church on a very fundamental level. But I think that's a good thing uh, because it's, it's because it's not causing wars because the church isn't being so staunch and dogmatic about it's, it's Christian doctrine and it's a giving way to these updates. It's not causing war or strife or murders, you know, as it used to back in the day, when, when you, when you held the belief like homosexuality back in the day, it would just kill you. Like that's heresy, right? That's wrong for you to believe that because we have this absolute way from that's spoken from God for how to think and how to live. And because we're being more flexible nowadays with how, what we accept as doctrine and what we accept as truth, it's a healthier stance. Um, so yeah, I, I think maybe that answers your question. Yeah. <laughs> It's just engaging in the dialogue, and that's one of the qualities yeah. of existentialism where whether it's you being scrutinized for a thing that you say and believe or Christianity being questioned about certain aspects of it, you can't simply just shut down the idea of of the questions being asked in an attempt to not want to change, which I think many organizations and people do. But one mm. of the qualities of existentialism is this idea of you know, there's more that I don't know than I do know, or the more that I learn, the more I realize I don't know anything at all. Right. And so it would be silly of me to know that and then to not hear other people out, whether they're questioning my actions. Hey, I yeah. didn't, I don't really know if when you, when you said those things to that person, it was really in line with the values that you told me that you believe in, or, or mm -hmm. it's Christianity being questioned on whether or not they should allow homosexuality or any of the other aspects of it, right? I think a more, a quality of goodness is to be able to hear out opposing viewpoints and truthfully consider it, what we were talking about earlier, being able to yeah. entertain the idea of other thoughts. Because sometimes, every once in a while, a, a good idea comes around and then you want to apply it because you want to improve yourself or you want to pursue better quality, a better quality life, things of yeah. that nature. So I think that's kind of what you were getting at. Yeah. And, and I can't, I think it really underneath that comes with the virtue of doubt. 
that I think is is one of the <laughs> one of the virtues that aren't even a virtue, but I, I think it's an existentialist virtue is that idea of doubt. And, and carrying that attitude where you you might be wrong. It's epistemic humility. It's having this humility for what we know or what we think we know. And so always giving that space to have your mind changed and um, look at an alternative is a very healthy mindset. And I think that's that it is a virtue and that leads to humi- humility and that leads to a better life, in my opinion. Yeah. And it's also questioning the things that we do value because you know, our conversation on status anxiety in particular hits home with me because, you know, the farm style house with a sauna and a cold plunge sounds awesome. Dude, I would love to have a, a 10 acres of land and a, and be able to do my cold plunge every morning and optimize my heart health by doing my 20 minutes in the sauna, right? Like, nice. I, I think that that would be awesome. And I would value having those things, right? But it, it requires me to sort of take a step back and think like, why do I value those things? And, and the idea that I'm going to live my whole life not being able to acquire some of the things that I think would be cool to have, like that kind of is a crappy thought for me to entertain, right? Mm-hmm. Um, this makes me think of, do you know who Chris Williamson is? I do, yeah. He's a podcaster, right? Yeah, so I, I talk about him a lot on the show. It's a guy that I really admire. And he came up with this term, and I don't, I don't actually think that he... Um, meant it in this context but in a way it's very related where uh, people always say the term um, that guy bought that thing with fuck you money like mm. if i had fuck you money i would buy this this and this it's kind of like bucket list stuff right right and he coined the term off of that fuck you family which makes no sense when you say it out loud but basically mm-hmm. it's the same premise that we're talking about here is we value monetary gain and status and things so much that if only we could achieve a certain amount of money, you put that term $100,000 up earlier, like somewhere usually around that threshold where we can kind of do whatever we want to, to a certain extent, mm-hmm. then we then we buy all the things that we want. But what, he, what he's proposing with this term, you family, is that you can actually reframe what you value and for a lot of people and something that's accessible to most people that's family if you can't work yourself to the wealth that you want to which is reserved for a pretty small percentage of people in our society what you can do is you can have a family and now all of a sudden it doesn't matter how much money you make because if your children and your spouse are happy and they're living a good quality of life and you get to have experiences with them and create memories, all of a sudden now you are living this very meaningful life. And I think that that's a route that a lot of people go down without even really realizing it. Yeah. I think it's hardwired into our DNA is to obviously procreate and pass down our genetics, but uh, the values definitely shift. I think, I think I heard something about what you're talking about with, with the family. Um, it's that because we're so wrapped up in our own individual pursuits and our own ambition, when you have kids, your values shift and you're no longer so obsessed with climbing the ladder because so much of your interest and your fulfillment in life comes through being present with your child. You know what I mean? I I think that's kind of, uh, he, he was saying that it's your family in that sense and that your values aren't really like the herd who are just um, caught up in the rat race and pursuing their ambition to achieve uh, status and wealth. And you can really be your contentment is in the family that you found and that you, that you're creating. Um, it, yeah. And I it, think too, it was getting at like, there's a certain level of happiness or fulfillment that exists when we are able to figure out how to get something in excess and so like fuck you money is excess money. It's when you have too yeah, much yeah. money, you don't know what to do with. And so fuck you family is like when you, when you reframe your values in such a way that your family is just giving you so much. Like I have I, excess family isn't the right way to word it, but the amount of joy and love and, and experience that you get from being with your significant other and your children, it, it puts you in that same sort of realm of excess to where you, you feel joyous and happy and fulfilled. Gotcha. Okay. And then, so you can kind of give the middle finger to er, finger, middle finger to everyone else because you, uh, 
I, I guess you're happier than them in their pursuit of whatever they're pursuing in their ambition towards wealth, right? So it's just yeah. like their their meter of happiness is well above that other person's happiness who is who doesn't have a family and they're just caught up in their ambition to pursue wealth. Yeah, and I think that that's something that maybe this message is is meant for like the young ambitious person. I just got engaged a couple of weeks ago and like oh, I've already yeah. Thanks man. Yeah. Uh, but I'm already feeling that. Like now my goal in life is not that this ever changed, but it's it's more real now the idea that I will have a family one day. And so yeah. it's it's reframed a lot of the things that I value in terms of it's given me a bit more patience towards the goals that I have for myself. And obviously this is a very multifaceted thing because you know, monetary gain is important. If you if you had a family and you were dirt poor and you couldn't provide for them, that would make right. you feel horrible. Like the money is very, it, it's an important aspect of living a good quality life for sure. But yeah. now it's easier for me to see the idea that all of this work that I'm doing isn't for the things anymore. It's for the family and the, in the, in the family that I'm going to have one day that I, I don't quite know what that's going to look like yet, but it's more real. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I, I think the game though changes. So the, the ambition, because the, your peers aren't all the other single individual individuals who are pursuing whatever, whatever that you're pursuing, because we don't really measure ourselves with, with people who are out of our league. So like, you don't measure yourself against like the Brad Pitts and, um, you know, Kinnear, Kieran Hat Knightley's of the world. It's just their wealth is something that most, no, mostly no one will ever touch. Right. But status anxiety comes from you comparing yourself to the people around you, your inner circle, They'll, those who you, uh, those are the people like your family or your best friends. Um, those, so those are the people you actually measure your, yourself up with. And so it naturally what, what it becomes is like, you'll, you'll start to measure yourself up against other families. And, um, and I think that's reflected in social media. I, I think that's really social media in all its, in all of its, um, flaws and, and, um, just, uh, in in authenticity, it still it broadcasts the truth in a very real sense is that we are competitive creatures. And even if it's in a family setting, we still find ways to compete against other, uh, family, family wives or other families, lifestyles and, you know, judge who's better than the other. Uh, we're just very much competitive in that way. And we'll find ways to eke that in, but it, it still, it doesn't remove you from, uh, checking yourself and still being content with what you have. I, I still think you can be caught up even though the, the pursuit isn't money anymore. Like that isn't the goal. And it's just this, it becomes the new goalpost becomes like this family status of happiness that if you're not pursuing that happiness or that if you're not achieving it, you're in a, in a way a failure in another sense, you know? So I think the game just gets twisted a little bit. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What, what are your thoughts? I'm kind of just thinking out loud here. Well, you know, this wraps to the, what we talked about at the beginning, right? How many variables are there? We don't know. Which variables do you care about? You could probably name a couple off the top of your head. Okay. But also are there subconscious variables? Probably. How many of those are there? I don't know. You know, like we could just keep playing this game of like our, our values are, are given to us by the position we were born into. It's the nature versus nurture uh, conversation, honestly, when it, what it comes down to is it's not one or the other, it's both. And our values are dictated by those things as well. And and then you add into this element of as you get older and we're sort of aware of our existence, right? It's mm -hmm. also not just nature and nurture, right? Because that sort of are things that happen to you where you're born and all the experiences. But you also have the ability to think about yourself and your consciousness and your existence. And so that sort of is a third element that, that we can use to manipulate the thing that we care about, if that makes sense, right? Because, for example, to bring the Christian example back, I also grew up in a Christian household. And so 
a lot of the values that I have and care about are very highly influenced by that. Right. Sure. That would yeah. be the, um, no, you know, nature and nurture argument. But then as I've gotten older and I can reflect on my time growing up in the church, which we weren't extremely devout and I wasn't there every single Sunday, I can sort of think, okay, what do, what do I think about this time of my life? What do I think about these values? And if I want to, because of my consciousness, I can shift some of those, the ways that I was thinking about those things. So I guess that makes it harder too. And I think not to get too far down that rabbit hole, but that that answer to your question there was is sort of a summation of the stuff that we've been talking about, right? It's the questions that matter. It's the thinking that matters. And sort of to wrap up this conversation a bit more about existentialism itself is you and I are people who like to have these dialogues with others and ourself, right? Mm -hmm. I think about my existence and what I value and where I'm going to be all the time. And this is something that I've actually never really given thought to because I don't think that I've ever had a problem with it. But you're somebody who teaches philosophy to others and you you study it in a in a way that you're thinking about sharing some of these ideas with other people. And so for people who don't naturally do this in terms of thinking and, and having these conversations or people who want to get into it, there's mm-hmm. this sort of void that I think if you peer too far into, you can sometimes get lost or you can spiral. And a good example of that was realizing this radical freedom that we all have. Like your values were given to you. Are you sure you want to have those values? Like that's a tough question to actually contemplate. Mm-hmm. So do you have any sort of best practices for people who maybe want to start contemplating some of these tougher questions as to not venture too far down the hole? No, I think we're actually pretty good in that we're set up with this checks, checks and balances uh, internally where uh, that's kind of guided by your interest. So you, your interest will lead you to a, a philosophical book, for example. You're like, okay, I'm, I'm kind of interested in stoicism, right? Because uh, there's a lot of humming of, the, of that going on in, in, in pop culture and stuff. So yeah, let, let's, uh, let's pick up... Um, the obstacles, the way by Ryan holiday. And you, you get introduced to certain stoic ideas and you're like, okay, um, well, this is interesting. I, I'll go and explore, um, some, some compatible things with this. And maybe you, you find existentialism in, uh, uh, or stoicism in Nietzsche in a Morfati because he, he speaks about Morfati as well. And he had some, um, he pulled some ad- admiration or he had some admiration for it. Also the priest, uh, priest Socratics. And you're like, okay, well, my interest is, is taking me here, and then it's it's taking you further. Um, but again, this um, the system of checks and balances is also operating where it's like, okay, this isn't um, this isn't really giving me any practical. Um, it's not really informing my my life enough to where it's not it's it's not becoming practical. Like absorbing all this information, it's good. I think. An, in nature, we're very practical people. We're very practical beings, and we will only absorb knowledge insofar as it's practical. I really, I truly believe that. So, I mean, philosophers they they have um, it's just what they do. Like academic philosophers, they they philosophize, but you don't see like, like a lot of people just philosophizing for philosophy's sake or reading philosophy books without a legit practical outlet. Um, and um. So I, I I think just to your question, I know this is way long winded, uh, but to give advice to that, I I, I think that um, to not get sucked down in the rabbit hole and go uh, to feel what you're saying is like there can be some kind of uh, um, I guess confusion with digging into philosophy and, and getting lost in it too much. Um, there is. I think that happens way less than you might think. Uh, I think people can really either in in the wrong way that they're being inauthentic and they justify why they, uh, what they're doing, what they're doing, or they're only, so they're only interested, say um, Christians. So they'll only be looking into theologians or people who kind of, they know that will confirm what they already believe. Um, so from a psychological perspective, the, the, the idea of 
you becoming lost in philosophy and, and staring into the gaze of the, the abyss for too long and you lose your soul or you kind of, you become a schizophrenic. Uh, I don't think you have to be too worried about that. I think you, you do have like this internal compass that will guide you to um, the, the appropriate amount of philosophy for you and just, just keep it light, keep it fun. Um, there's a lot of good stuff out there on YouTube and, and books and people are actually being, more practical in that they're making uh, the writing books that are more success, more accessible to laymen, uh, people who aren't professional philosophers. And um, yeah, I did, I, I, and I guess to the, the, the fringe, maybe, maybe I should just um, leave a placeholder out there that there, it could lead to an, a danger. Um, but to be honest, I don't know if you're, if you feel like you're falling into a pit with philosophy, just go hang out with your friends. I think I think I've done that. Just go back to your base baseline, practical, uh, what you think would be fun with with people, because people really takes you outside of your head. You know, you, you just. I think I, I have done that because maybe now I'm having a, a memory of when uh, philosophy did kind of con contort me a little bit, and I was I was a little bit lost of, as to a sense of who I was. But being around the people that are meaningful to you and that who you find fulfillment with, that really brings you back to center, brings you back to baseline. Yeah. It, it, while you were talking there, it made me think, have you ever heard of the quote, you have two ears and one mouth and you should use them accordingly? Yes, I have. So I've heard this phrase and I don't think it was meant in the same context but it can be applied in the same way, which is you have two hands and one brain, use them accordingly. Right. Mm, yeah. And so I think that there's something to be said about this idea that if you are getting too heady, it's likely because you're not doing enough doing. And one of the cool aspects of philosophy is that it needs to be backed by your own evidence and experience. And so if you're not doing anything,